Hi guys, I am Vidold and I finally met the legend. Honda Africa Twin was the first motorcycle that I saw in my life and was stunned. It was on a Greek island, I was a few years old and this huge bike was standing next to some restaurant with those two big round lamps. Huge! But years have passed, Africa was no longer sold by Honda, so the legend had to stay just in my memories, mostly. But till now, I just spent some time with the newest 2022 Honda Africa Twin 1100 in the adventure sports version with a larger fuel tank, adjustable suspension, and automatic DCT transmission. It's one of a kind because of this transmission, and it totally caught me off guard with how it worked. And I'll tell you about it, as this will be a key for many of you guys here, I think. You might hate or you may love this transmission and you may also hate or love this bike regardless of the transmission. And what I'm willing to do here is to explain how it feels to ride the newest Africa Twin 1100 and which one you might want to choose for yourself to be happy with it. And I know what I would choose or rather what I would not choose to ride in certain conditions. So let me first start with an overall impression as this was not usual for me in the case of this bike. I entered the showroom and there were Africas everywhere. Half of all the bikes displayed were Africa Twins, four or five adventure sports in this uh, cool color sheen and maybe just two regular ones with also normal transmission. Now the salesperson told me that they're selling about half of both types. I gotta say that's interesting because I myself would hesitate a lot before getting an automatic transmission in a motorcycle and especially in a bike like Africa Twin which is able to go off-road and can do it pretty pretty well. Now would you take your scooter or a moped off the road? Perhaps not really but in fact well I've got to say that being able to control the throttle better and forget about having to watch the clutch to not kill the engine may be helpful a lot, I think. And of course you may lose some control and so on, but we'll get to that. So the first impression was intimidating just standing next to the bike. I'm 183 centimeters tall, around six feet tall. I've ridden most of the motorcycles in this adventure category over the years and I was still impressed maybe even overwhelmed by the size of the Africa. It's really huge. In the pictures or from the distance, it, it, it looks like a normal bike, but it's got fine proportions and that's why. But this is partly because you've got a huge 21 inch front rim and that's not the only thing that's unusual as the rear rim is also not standard. Here you've got an 18 inch rim in the rear. So the whole bike is like a whole size up from what you would normally expect. Unfortunately, somehow, it also feels a whole size or two heavier. Having said that, I'm immediately adding that it doesn't feel so heavy always. And there is one set of circumstances in which it feels super nice and freaking nimble. I'll tell you about it. So Africa is really tall with a wide fuel tank area, regardless of the version. There's a very wide handlebar and a super tall front end with this, with this display and a windshield. Now BMW R 1250 GS Adventure is bulky and tall and you expect it to be, while you might not exactly expect Africa Twin to be so large. Now how does this translate into controlling the bike when you are riding? Not very well as the bike is super, super top heavy. I mean that its center of gravity seems to be really high and the bike is not very precise when riding at lower speeds. And I would compare it to a Suzuki V-Strom 1050 XT that feels actually lighter than this Africa Twin Adventure Sports, even though it likely is nine kilograms heavier with fuel. So Africa Twin Adventure Sports should weigh 238 kilograms likely with fuel, even though Honda doesn't seem to officially state if it is with fuel, and if so, then with how much fuel? Now, same with Suzuki. So the bottom line is that Africa should be lighter, but feels heavier to me comparing these two. Balancing when riding between the cars is really hard and not very precise at low speeds. There's a lot of additional movement and you've got to focus really hard and you will still feel like Africa sometimes decides for yourself. In the city it was a struggle because of all that and also because of a little bit less precision in controlling the throttle at those super low speeds and setting off. With traditional gearbox with a clutch, you may make the clutch slip a little bit, combine this slip with how much throttle you add and you can move 
however you want. Here with this automatic gearbox, you can only add throttle and the gear is engaged all the time when you're riding. So you've got to be very careful with what you are doing with your right wrist or you may end up in trouble. And one thing I could determine at this point, it is not a bike that would feel well in tight spots and where precision matters. Doesn't mean it's bad, it's just how it is. It would be a good companion to kick some ass. It's a big fella that can be brutal and it is uh, as simple to use as a sword with this transmission, but is it actually? It's as easy to use as a lightsaber, which means that it's bloody complicated as hell, in fact, in the end. But it only is if you want to experience its full capabilities. If you only want to use the drive mode, then it's simple as a sword. Also, even though it wasn't really very warm, the bike would quickly get hot after stopping at the traffic light. So I could very clearly feel how my leg would catch all the heat coming from the engine on the right side. That is a minus here for me, as on a warmer day, I imagine that would be an even bigger issue. The fans were engaging rather quickly too, and I could hear them. Now, this is a strange part for me, because it's a bike with lots of open areas. I mean, there aren't many fairings. Air can easily come and additionally cool the engine. So, well, clearly it's not. Now, Honda has a reputation of building indestructible and reliable bikes, and I believe that too. So I trust that they knew what they were doing here, and the cooling is in fact enough to ensure that the bike stays reliable and doesn't overheat. So, all right. So what about handling and steering? And I've got to say a few more things here, including that even though the bike felt rather heavy overall and very top heavy, if you would just want to lean and turn, it would do it with ease. This is that super nice and nimble behavior that I mentioned before. So if there's a turn and you start leaning into it, the bike follows nicely and doesn't fight with you regardless of speed. This is unusual as riding straight and just changing directions a little bit, like maneuvering between the cars, it's very not happy. But once you start leaning a lot, it feels really good. And I wish I had a mountain road nearby to just fully enjoy it more. But this was so surprising to me, as Africa would, like, for those few seconds, it would turn into a very different bike than in all other circumstances, and it would be fantastic if Honda improved its balancing somehow to also provide control and precision when riding straight at lower speeds. Now, I understand that the huge front wheel may not exactly help that this uh, large ground clearance of 25 centimeters, Jesus, that's a lot. So a tiny bit larger even than in BMW F850GS and that high center of gravity, but why not to dream in the end? Still, a lot of respect to Africa for that enjoyable behavior. If you ride on some twisty road and stay away from any cities, this bike can be really fun. I'm telling you, if you plan on riding inside the city, you will likely not enjoy it much. Now, what about performance and this weird transmission? I've never said it before, but in terms of performance, it depends. Yeah, it depends on the mode that you choose. It is a little bit like with Harley Davidson Pan America right here, but the Harley would have always so much power to make you happy. And the only difference in certain modes would be happy or super happy. Here in Africa, it's either crappy, fine or happy. The top level, so happy, would be close to Suzuki V-Strom 1050 and already better than in BMW F850GS, if that helps define what happy would mean. So, in the regular riding mode, the simple D on the transmission, the bike engages high gears pretty quickly and while that's not a bad idea in general, the trouble is when you actually want to accelerate without planning it a lot up front, because then making Africa drop a gear or two may make it resist and it sometimes will just stay in a current very high gear and shake instead of rapidly and quickly accelerating. And I guarantee you that I would be upset myself about it if I wasn't made aware of that up front. So indeed it matched my expectations with the reality and that helped. In the end I believe that the only situation in which you might comfortably use the D mode is a highway, but an empty highway so that you don't have to overtake. And specifically highway, not just riding outside of the city as there you might want to overtake someone and you will need the bike to follow your command, which it doesn't really want to do. Consider the D mode as an eco mode or a slip mode. 
and I couldn't keep using it at all. Now, if you use one of the 473 buttons and switches on the handlebar, you will be able to change to the letter S and then choose number one, two, or three, the number of stripes next to it. One's a bit more responsive, two is nicely responsive, and three is a no lag responsive and is brutal. And I recommend using the first two modes in well, basically most situations as the number one is like a properly working D mode. Number two is quite fun and quick, but won't surprise you in an unnecessary way, while the number three has too much engine braking for my taste and its responsiveness is extremely fun when you are accelerating and it keeps the bike in the higher RPM thanks to staying in lower gears more so that you've got all the power when you want it. But engine braking is brutal and if you close the throttle it almost feels like pulling the front brake. It required too much throttle precision for my taste and all this actually applies to the urban riding mode in other modes you've got some predefined settings so it may all affect things differently so in the end of the day you may need a month of riding to find your preferred settings and create your own mode that suits you best and you can create two of those custom modes there are also predefined modes for off-roading with abs off but the thing is that in the road modes neither of them had a soft suspension setting and i'm not sure why honda couldn't add a comfort mode still with a lot of power and abs enabled already predefined two road modes were either in medium or hard suspension and here's a note from me as i was a little bit disappointed with it now i've got two things to say here the first is that I secretly wished for a super comfortable soft suspension like in previous generations of BMW F medium GS, so the F800 GS. But I quickly had to forget about it. It is not that comfortable in Africa and in the hard mode, it may actually feel a little bit stiffer than in the medium mode. So there's something going on. Medium is actually soft, but when you come and compress the suspension or when you are braking, or in the initial phase of absorbing road irregularities. But in general, the whole bike is affected by bigger bumps a lot. The second thing that I wanted to say is that small potholes are eliminated well. That is nice. And it's partly thanks to big wheels. But then if the surface itself is not super even, the bike stays rather shaking. And that was a little bit disappointing to me as well. I rode through a few speed bumps and it wasn't even close to doing the same on the older BMW F800 GS, which was just flying through them. I believe that it was still um, visibly less comfortable overall and less refined than the current BMW F850 GS, so the, the current one. I think GS totally beats it in terms of control, balancing and precision and load speeds. 10 out of 10 times I would choose that BMW if the contest was about that. Keep that in mind. We're talking about specific things. I'm not judging the bike as a whole yet. Yet. None, that's not the strongest area for Africa, especially with that front suspension also diving like crazy. There's 102 horsepower and 105 newton meters of torque, while the engine has 1084 cubic centimeters of displacement. It is an inline twin, so with two cylinders next to each other. And just like BMW F850, Africa feels similarly quick, but the sound that it generates is fabulous. BMW can go home and stay there. And this is thanks to the muffler, I believe. There are two pipes coming out of it. And whether there has been some special tweaking or not, this bike sounds really, really good, especially if we consider that it's an inline setup, not, not even a V-twin. And there's a lot of aggression. There's rough explosions. And it's, you know, it's just waiting there to, you know, rip somebody's face off. This was making me really excited and I believe that also was contributing to how I perceived the overall performance, which was perceived in the end quite well, unless it was uh, in the D mode, then you cannot consider it good at all. So anyway, I don't know if it's quicker than BMW F850 GS. I feel it might not be, but the sound made me believe that it was way quicker. And I really would like to hear it with an aftermarket exhaust as that could be like a good old one cylinder engine sending you know sound bombs into the air that's how this africa sounded and that was great to sum up the performance in d mode it's bad in s mode it's better while in the top s mode so with three stripes 
next to the S letter, it immediately reacts to throttle and is a little bit brutal. Enjoyable if you want it brutal. As for the transmission, sometimes it's where you want it to be, but remember that it will always be reactive. If you don't use the manual mode, for which you have two buttons behind and underneath the left handlebar, the bike will only reduce gears and let you accelerate quickly after you open the throttle and keep it this way for a moment. Then it will start dropping gears and actually accelerating. Take that into account as it's not immediate, just like in cars with automatic transmissions. It works just the same. You press the pedal, they reduce the gears, and then you start going. This is a difference versus CVT transmissions in scooters, for example, that give you more power just if you roll the throttle more. Here it's not only about rolling it open, but also about gearbox dropping gears. So it's a little bit more complicated. It feels strange to me, and it's hard for me to find justification for choosing a motorcycle with this gearbox, actually, unless you hear how it sounds when it's changing gears just here for yourself, guys. Here comes the biggest compliment ever. If you would like to have a budget version of a Mercedes G-Class 63 AMG, so the G-Wagon, then Honda Africa Twin with DCT transmission is your choice here. When this bike accelerates and changes gears on its own at high revs, it sounds like a V8 AMG engine in Mercedes-Benz cars. It is super enjoyable. It is super freaking cool. I loved it. This happens actually when you accelerate hard and you hear how the bike is matching the RPM. All that happens super quickly and it makes it sound very similarly to that V8 AMG uh, engine that is being mounted currently and used to be mounted, I mean different AMG engines, the V8 ones in Mercedes-Benz cars. I love this part. G-Class is a bit of a similar style. It's big with round front laps heavy and not that easy to steer as I've heard. Other than this, I've got only good things to say about what Honda has done with the DCT. It changes gears in a way that you don't feel them when accelerating. You don't feel the changes. Sometimes you might feel that, especially in more sporty modes, but mostly when it's downshifting as engine braking increases. So you, you are able to, to, to notice that suddenly it starts braking harder. But there are no sudden behaviors. It will not surprise you in a way that's dangerous. And the worst thing that it would do to me in one of those sporty modes was dropping to the first gear from the second when making it a, a tight turn. And it happened like twice, maybe, and it made me realize it's work and conclude that I would prefer to stay in the second gear in those circumstances. Once also it was switching back and forth between the first and second gear at certain speeds as it somehow couldn't decide where to stay that was in a low speed situation, a traffic jam as well. But in other times, the thing that I was afraid of never happened. I was a bit scared that, let's say, riding on the fourth, fifth or sixth gear, after rolling the throttle open, suddenly the bike would behave like a car. So it would suddenly drop to the second gear and, you know, just jump from underneath me. It doesn't do that. Instead, it drops gears one by one pretty quickly, still giving you some pulling power, but without suddenly delivering, delivering all that power on each gear and, and you know, shaking you forward and, and, and backward. Like, it's really, really refined and safe system, and I am super impressed with it. That's something, really. Honda's engineers are also improving it with every generation, and in 2022, it's really, really good already. Two more facts. First, you don't need to hold the brake to put it in drive mode because it doesn't crawl like a car with automatic gearbox. So having it in drive, it is not trying to roll slowly forward. And this is a very important information. And by the way, DCT stands for dual clutch transmission. The second thing is that from 2020 on, the system monitors your lean angle so that if you are in a tight turn at higher speed, it will not mess with your gears too much. And that's smart. It doesn't do it when you're taking the turn slowly, like I did twice in the city when it dropped those gears. But when it really matters, it's freaking good and safe. All right, so if you don't ride in the city and know that you want 
to have an Africa Twin, I would say that it may be worth considering the DCT transmission. But if you are not convinced, I will help you stay not convinced as I had one particular problem with it. There may be a kind of a solution, but not a 100% successful one, I bet. It's that on the left handlebar, you've got a horn. And also there is a weird indicator switch that is bent to the left. And also there is a downshifting button. If instead of hitting the indicator, you hit the downshift button, you may end up very surprised. This was actually bothering me. And uh, so uh, two things happened. First thing was that I was looking at the buttons before using any of them, mostly the indicators, to make sure that I use the right switch and do not honk or change a gear. And that second thing that happened was that when I should have used the horn once, I did nothing as I didn't want to look for the button and instead decided to just avoid a stupid driver. This otherwise could have been dangerous if I would be hesitating like this. The second thing, like the big second thing, is that you cannot use indicators, reduce gears and hold the handlebar at the same time. This just cannot work together. My conclusion is that, first of all, there are too many similarly positioned buttons next to each other and some of them are responsible for critical actions. And secondly, that it will need a long time to get used to that layout. And likely you won't avoid mistakes anyway. Now, here comes a possible help in like, let's say 33% of situations. Honda actually fulfilled my imaginary at that point wish and created an option of a lever installed, just like in a normal transmission that allows you to manually change gears with your left foot. Now, this would make me consider the DCT option much harder. You can use the buttons on the lever while being in automatic mode to temporarily override the bike's decision and change a gear or two or five. Or you can change the mode with that gray button on the right hand side of the handlebar and lock the bike out, giving yourself full manual control if you wish. This I like and it seems that Honda answered a lot of potential expectations this way and I, I like that but my Africa had no lever so manually changing gears seemed to me less important than using indicators and I gave up on manual control in the end at all and I wish there was a way of getting rid of the buttons fully totally completely to ensure that you won't suddenly drop a gear when you're willing to turn left or right or switch the indicators off a big complaint here is the front brake which was way too weak and it required squeezing with a lot of force. It was not a super old bike. It was a dealer's bike. Everything seemed to be working fine. Well, I could not comfortably use it with just one finger and that's a shame. It now doesn't happen so often that a bike in this class, in this category for that kind of money as well, has a front brake that does not do the job well enough. And this Africa Twin 1100 doesn't. In my opinion, it doesn't. The rear brake is fine and works, while we know that in some other bikes it may feel like it's doing nothing, like for example in other bikes like Harley-Davidson Pan America. So Honda should definitely work on the front brake, in my opinion, as it doesn't give much confidence and it just isn't pleasant to use this way. That's below industry standard. About the seat, it's one of the hardest seats that I've ever sat on and it may compete with the standard seat in Yamaha Tracer 9. With both, you may kill somebody if you would like to use them as a, let's say, baseball bat for protection. Here in the Africa, it's wide enough. It's definitely not too narrow and it's also adjustable between 85 and 87 and a half centimeters from the ground. I was riding it in the lower position. It was fine for my height. I didn't feel like I'm sitting and riding in a war thug. The knee angle was already fine for me at that position. If you were a big fella, Africa Twin, I think, should welcome you with very open arms and you should welcome it with open arms as well. There are also taller and lower seat options available if you'd like. And it's a very similar story to the windshield that Honda lowered by default, that they made it lower by default for 2022. And this windshield actually does a pretty good job. I was surprised. I didn't expect that, but maybe because all that front is so high. At higher speeds, of course, it doesn't protect you so much, but thanks to the bike's 
this bulky and tall front fairings, your chest is, I feel, mostly well covered. I think I wouldn't complain much as I haven't noticed any specific turbulences out there. The height adjustment isn't the, the best, it's for some unexplainable reason it requires you to use both hands at the same time, so you've got to stop basically to adjust it. There are better systems in other motorcycles and BMW and Ducati have the best know-how on how to pull this ungodly task off. Also, there is a chain drive. Fuel tank is larger in this adventure sports version than in the regular Africa Twin and here it's 24.8 liters while in the regular version it's 18.8 liters. The regular version is supposed to weigh 226 kilograms so it's 12 kilograms lighter. Perhaps this could make some difference in feeling not so top heavy, maybe, but it's not that huge of a difference. The equipment includes ABS, it includes traction control, those riding modes, cornering LED lamp for this, specifically for this adventure sports version that also can have this adjustable, electrically adjustable Showa suspension. Both versions can have the DCT transmission as an option. You've got to, you've got to pay for that. Both also have a touch screen. Da -da. Scary as hell. Some icons are small, but it thankfully mostly reacts to pressing it through a glove. It is supposed to not to react to touch when riding, but you can control it also from the handlebar using thousand inconsistently looking in terms of design and shape buttons and looking at them also constantly to figure out which might do what exactly. No big deal, you will quickly give up and stick to one mode that you like the most. Also, there's way too much little stuff on the screen, I think, in this particular mode that I was writing in. I'm not sure I would need to know at all times that in the current mode, the W and HSTC are at number three and number seven at the moment. It looks clear the display is crisp but that initial message that appears for a long time after switching the bike on and it doesn't disappear at least before you get mad and find a button that you need to press twice to accept this super crazy important warning every single day i'm just gonna say that it's very very annoying and this would drive me nuts every day <laughs> all right both versions of the bike can also have handguards that are nice. There are cross-spoked wheels and you may be adding crash bars that make Africa look even more badass. Mirrors seemed fine to me. Adventure Sports has heated grips and both versions have cruise control as standard. That's a nice touch. There is no keyless start, which I like so much, but there is a handbrake with this DCT transmission. So you get at least something else. <laughs> Literally, I mean a handbrake used with a with a hand it's in the spot where otherwise the clutch would be and it's moved far away so that you don't pull it accidentally thinking that it actually is clutch if you're not used to the bike's automatic transmission since you cannot leave the bike in the gear so that it doesn't roll down the slope that makes sense and honda came up with this interesting solution and it enables you to actually also lock it in the position with another little kind of a lever thingy that is there that's pretty fancy and you can also connect your phone to the system and control some of its functions via the buttons on the handlebar. If you go for the regular Africa Twin with traditional gearbox, you may also equip it with a quick shifter. A lot of respect for Honda for giving us so many different solutions, which might be good actually, really. This is clearly one of the most important models, definitely in terms of image, along with the Honda Goldwing. Now, if you wonder if I have found any engineering or um, design mistakes here like I have in most other motorcycles then apart from the windshield adjustment system there hasn't been anything that would appear as clearly done wrong the number of buttons the switches and the display would be one big issue that makes the whole experience really counterintuitive but it isn't literally a flaw like a handlebar hitting your windshield if you know what I mean, Harley Davidson. If you want to see how many simple things a manufacturer can show up, go check my Harley Davidson Pan America special video with an honest review of it, similar to this one. Some uh, last remarks are that the bike feels solid and everything works smoothly. I liked that the front indicators served also as positioning lights and they were on all the time with that LED ring light up front. And overall, I haven't found anything that would seem of low quality in the whole bike, maybe except for the screen design again and the brake but it's about how they work not what they are made of in this in those two cases if you'd like to take africa twin off-road 
which should be its second nature, or maybe even if it's considered that way its first nature, I think you might want to choose some high speed chases over sands, slowing down and trying to steer precisely, maybe even more challenging than steering precisely on tarmac. I'm not sure I would be so much up to it. I would definitely prefer to do it on BMW F850 GS, definitely. I'm not a fan of that BMW generally, but in terms of how it handles, I feel it's beyond Honda's reach at the moment. Maybe really at higher speed of roading, it wouldn't matter that much. So take that also into account. The Legend of Honda Africa Twin does impress me myself. I like it. Now the price of the base unit, so not the adventure sports version and without the DCT automatic transmission also impresses me. I've got to tell you, it actually saddens me as well. Despite knowing how much research and engineering Honda uh, had to put into this bike to make it all happen. But being 25% more expensive in the base version than a, a similar BMW F850 GS sounds a little bit ridiculous to me. But wait for this. The Adventure Sports version costs 4% more than a base BMW R1250 GS. And I don't think that's really acceptable. Adding a DCT transmission that could be the ultimate reason for choosing Honda Africa Twin today, and I would understand it, as it's the only bike in the segment with this kind of solution, but then you've got to pay over 10% more than for a base R1250 GS, which is a benchmark, isn't it? And I cannot imagine that I would, I don't think I would ever go for such a deal with Honda. The name of Africa Twin is not so much more of a legend than the name of a BMW GS is or can be because maybe, well, it's hard to judge. Maybe BMW GS is a bigger name. But if riders buy Africas, it means that the bike is worth that much money to them and it's everyone's own perception. So it's up to you guys. The way I was riding it, so not off the road, really, and also in the city, I would give it six out of 10. If you are going to be riding outside of the city and will benefit a lot from its initial agility in corners, it may translate into seven out of 10, I think, especially that it's so surprising <laughs> for a bike like this. In the end, this usually doesn't happen, but that would be a fair six and a half out of 10. I don't usually give half, but I'm impressed by the transmission. At the same time, the level of complication is so high and the need of constantly changing the mode would, I think, kill me along with that freaking stupid warning message at the screen. We've got to give Honda credit for the technological aspect here. So also, please let me know what you guys are thinking about it. And if any of you has bought the Africa Twin, please let us know where you feel it is best to ride it. See you in the next video. Bye.